Our reading for this evening is taken from the New Testament and from the first epistle of John. Almost all the way to the end of the Bible, you've got Revelation, uh, and then just before that you've got Jude, and then you've got three wonderful little books by the Apostle John. We'll be reading uh, the fourth chapter of 1 John. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We'll be looking at words from that chapter in a little while. If you've come to hear Chris Reese tonight, I must apologise for not being him. But uh, um, when I got the message, I I rushed home and printed out um, a sermon I did a few weeks ago. The context of this sermon was, um, was, I preached it in Hebron, Daulis, um, on the 31st of December. It was written with the new year in mind. And whilst I will try and modify it as I go on, you may see some some aspects of, of, of why I wrote it then. But it really deals with how the Christian should consider things and uh, look ahead to things. Of course, New Year is a time to, to look ahead, but we always look ahead, don't we? Uh, as a Sunday, we're looking ahead to, to the coming week. Perhaps you have uh, work plans, you have uh, plans to see fa- family, friends, um, things you intend to do, but... The unexpected can happen, can't it? Uh, we live in a world where 
our plans are at best guidelines and often things don't work out the way we expect. We live in a world that is characterised by uncertainties. There are the uncertainties of our everyday lives. There are uh, the things that happen that we never expected, but that early morning phone call, that unexpected diagnosis, uh, these um, sudden incidences uh, in the workplace or on the roads that, well, we didn't see that coming. And looking into the year, the coming year, most of which still lies ahead of us, there are many uncertainties in our land and in our world. This year, we'll see the details regarding Brexit being decided, probably. Because of the snap election we had uh, six months ago, we have a minority government uh, being uh, supported on some issues by the DUP. And I'm sure you could get fairly good odds, not that you would, but on uh, an early election taking place even this year. Who knows what that would mean for us as a country, for good or for ill. As we look further afield than just our land, well, North Korea is certainly a very active issue. It is growing in belligerency and despite um, the sanctions placed upon it, despite um, uh, the US um, determining to do things well, it seems it's been, it, we, the world generally are unable to rein in the actions of this state. Tensions are running fairly high between Western Europe and Russia. Uh, Russia are thought to be behind some cyber attacks on British computer systems. Conflict ongoing in Ukraine, whether we hear about it every day or not. In the USA, they're facing a government shutdown um, because of uh, a stalemate in the Senate. Um, Trump is proving to be a very divisive figure. And the USA, which for good or ill has been the world's policeman for the last 60, 70 years, seems to be, to a certain extent, withdrawing from a prominent involvement in world politics. Within countries, as well as between countries, division characterizes much of the internal politics. Spain and Germany and Austria and Belgium and the UK, um, Northern Ireland and so on. When we look ahead, when we try and predict what this year will hold, well, it might be wonderful. It might be disastrous. And perhaps many people in this world, as they look ahead from mid-January and they try and discern what will happen and what might happen, well, many are fearful and there are good reasons for them to fear as they look at the future. But forget about them. What about you? If you are a Christian here this evening, how do you feel as you look at the situation, your personal situation, uh, your country's political situation, the world situation. Should the Christian be fearful? Should the Christian literally be full of fear as they look around and ahead? Or should the Christian be relaxed about everything? Uh, the Christian never breaks into a sweat. They're never bothered by anything. They just take life as it comes. Nothing bothers them. They have this almost fatalistic sense of everything. K sera, sera, what will be, will be. How should the Christian look ahead? Should the Christian know fear? Well, firstly, we must not deny our humanity. We must uh, remember that God has made us a certain way. We have certain Inbuilt, inbuilt systems that are there designed by God for our well-being. So if danger faces us, um, then the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and it activates the, the fight or flight response and we, we feel a certain tension in our bodies to better equip our bodies for action. So when danger is perceived, there is a certain physical reaction. Now that's certainly cannot be wrong for the Christian to experience that. Think of the Lord Jesus, close to Calvary. He's, 
He's in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. He has an intense, physical, stressful, as it were, reaction going on in his body. The awareness of this imminent physical and mental anguish that lies ahead for him, it has a profound response upon him. For any of us, God has designed our bodies a certain way to, to avoid danger, to avoid pain where possible. But what about in the more general sense? Should I be afraid, not of a, a perceived danger immediately ahead of me, but something that might happen in the near future or um, at some point? With political uncertainty, military tensions, increasing hostility to Christians who seek to live biblical lives, is there not much to be afraid of, much that might worsen in 2018? Yes, there is. But what did we read in 1 John 4, 18, which I would like as our text for this evening? 1 John 4, 18 tells us, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. How are we to understand this? Does this mean if I'm afraid, if I have a sense of fear about something, about anything, that I'm a bad Christian or perhaps not even a Christian at all? How does this verse uh, fit in with with other verses? Uh, For example, 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Or Romans 11, um, chapter 20, um, uh, speaking of the Gentiles. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Uh, The warnings of Christ, Luke 12, verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him him well let's consider the context of one john and i'm aware that midweek meetings i've spoken from one john more than once it's um, a wonderful pet book of mine it's so forgive me if you've heard this 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 overall context um talk already but this book is written by the apostle john it's written late in his life probably about a.d eighty five ninety John is now an old man he's in his late seventies at the earliest. He writes to Christians uh, one John five verse thirteen tells you to whom he writes and why he writes. It is with the purpose of grounding them and assuring them in their faith. The immediate recipients of this letter well they've had some false teachers amongst them. those false teachers have now left. But whilst they were in the church, they have stirred up significant confusion amongst the Christians. And so John writes to encourage them and to assure them, to remind them of vital and fundamental truths, to give them signs of what a real Christian will look, act, feel and respond like. Um, What a Christian, a real Christian will look like to God, to, to other Christians. John's writing is not the logical and precise step-by-step argument you would get with Paul, but rather it's a a poetical style that goes over the same themes, the same subjects, but as he comes back to them again and again, he he, uh, deepens them and he applies the same themes in different ways as it arises. In 1 John chapter 4, he is speaking about what a true teacher of Christ will look like, in that they will confess the truth about Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is God come in the flesh. And then John goes on to speak about how uh, love is an essential aspect of the Christian. Because love is at the core of who God is, and if someone claims to be a Christian, they claim to have met with that God of love through Jesus Christ, then love must be um, an essential aspect of the Christian. If God is love, 
and if the Christian is in God and God is in them, love must be evident in that person's love, life. A love for God and a love for the people of God. Because if I say I love God and I meet the people of God who are special to him, I must love the people of God also. It's like, like a man who has a photo of his wife. He loves his wife. The photo is not the wife, but the photo reminds him of his wife. If you disrespect his wife, you're in trouble. But if you disrespect the photo, you're in trouble because that reminds him of his wife. If you say, I love God, but the Christian, the one who is resembling God, who is growing in conformity to God, means nothing to me. That is a glaring inconsistency. And then we get to verses 17 and 18. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So I have three questions for you this evening. Do you love God or do you fear God? How should you see the day of judgment? What should you do to put away fear? Well, that first question, do you love God or do you fear God? In verse 18, uh, the implication is that love and fear are, are sort of opposites. There is love, uh, there is fear, but perfect love casts it out. It's a very much a, a throwing idea. Uh, perfect love casts out fear. It's saying it displaces it. They cannot coexist. But you might immediately say, well, aren't there all those verses you've already quoted? Didn't we, isn't it good and sensible for a creature to fear God? Didn't we begin our worship with Psalm 111? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, the Lord who's being spoken of is the God who rules on high, the great God who rules on high, surrounded by angels, angels who are so glorious that John sees one and he falls at his feet as though dead, but angels who dare not look upon God because he is so much more glorious, infinitely more glorious. This is the God we are speaking of, the one who does whatsoever pleases him, the one who uh, sees the fall of a sparrow and is in control of the movement of galaxies. The one who knows the numbers of hairs that are upon your head. Who knows you intimately. He has designed your whole frame, every aspect of your body. He knows every single part of it down to the contents of each individual cell. The God who knows exactly how many heartbeats your life will hold. How many heartbeats your life has remaining. The God who sees your innermost thoughts and desires. The God who, who knows even every unformed word uh, er, that is upon your lips. The God who sees every good deed you do from a mixed motive. The God who is aware of every impure thought. The God who knows every duty you have neglected. Him. The God who is not some idle bystander. The God of gods infinitely pure who demands nothing less than infinite purity from you also this is the God we're speaking of when I say do you love God or do you fear him this God is the judge of all the earth who, call, who calls to account every man and woman this world has ever seen the one who is so pure and so holy that every impurity is an act of personal rebellion against him a rebellion that must be accounted for the God whose justice is so pure that a right punishment for opposing him is an eternity away from his favour, an eternity of misery and regret, an eternity of facing deserved wrath and judgment. You would be a fool not to fear this God. And yet we have this verse that says there is another way to relate to God that displaces fear. That when this perfect love fills an individual, there is no space left for fear. Rather, it casts out the fear because the fear and the love cannot exist in the same limited space. 
When I wrote this sermon, it was, it was late at night and one of those winter storms that has uh, caused so much damage uh, to property was going on. And it was about, I don't know, one, two in the morning and I went to make myself a coffee. And here's the mug with the grains or the, the instant coffee and I'm pouring in the water and all these storms going on outside. I go to look, I go to look back at the coffee and I've lost my concentration. I catch it just in time. It's not overfilled, but the mug is completely filled. And I want to put the milk in, and there's no space for it in there. Because the container is filled, I cannot add anything more. What John is, John is saying is, when the Christian is so filled with love, there is no room left for fear. That's, that's what he's saying. Um, that when you are filled with love, when love is completed in you, when there is this perfect love within you. It's not that you shouldn't fear, but you cannot fear. There is no room left for fear because you are filled with love. Fear can no longer fit in. This perfect love that completes, that is completed within you, as it were, has cast out fear. It cannot remain in you. Do you love God or do you fear God? The sadness for many Christians is that our love for God is so weak and faint. We have plenty of room for fear because we have such little love within us. John is not telling us that it is wrong to fear God because one of the great tragedies of this world is that there are many in this present world who neither love God nor fear him. But the Christian can never be content with merely fearing God because there is so much more to pursue. Our verse tells us it is perfect love, a being filled with love that casts out fear. Is this our love for God or is it God's love for us? Well, it speaks of perfect love, perfect meaning full, complete, mature, now, God, who is love, his love for us must, by definition, be perfect. But I don't think God, John would need to specify that we need to have perfect love. If we have the love of God, we have perfect love because it's God's love. But I think John is speaking of something else. He is speaking of our love for him that needs to be a, a perfect complete, mature love, a, a satisfaction in him and him alone, a longing for him and a, a contentment for him, uh, a love that is satisfied with nothing but him so that no idol can replace him um, in his throne in our hearts. True love is no mere hormonal effect, but it is a committed longing for the other. It is a desire to see the other prosper, a desire to uh, de a delight in growing in knowledge and relationship with the other. Perfect love casts out fear, says our, ver our text. In this is our love made perfect, says verse 17. And yet this very love that is our love that is from us, as it were, is only there because of the prior working of God. Verse 19 goes on to tell us, we love him because he first loved us. Any love I have for God is not something that's arisen from, from scratch within me. Rather, if I have a love for God, a, a perfect love for God, even a faint, weak love for God, it is because of his prior working, his drawing me to himself, his making me alive, a new creature, an adopted son in Christ Jesus. If he truly is at work in me, there will be a growing and maturing love within me for him to know him and to grow in him and to please him in all that I do. In addition to this, I will love those who love him. I will love more and more those who are growing to resemble him. How can I not love those he loves? 
How can I not love those who, like me, love him? We have a shared desire, a common joy. When I hear of others' experience of God, that should deepen my knowledge of God and cause me to more greatly delight in him. So Christian, do you love God or do you fear God? The second question, how should you see the day of judgment? Verse 18 says, Perfect love casts out fear. Fear of what? Uh, Fear hath torment, punishment, a penalty, a a suffering of some kind. Um, But verse 17 talks about a day of judgment when we will have boldness, uh, a confidence. It looks ahead to this, this day of judgment, this day of reckoning, when an account will be demanded, when a sentence will be declared. Think of two men in the dock of a courtroom. Both of them are charged with the same offence. Both of them to be found guilty. Both of them will face the same penalty, some great fine. And both of them appear confident and relaxed. One of them is relaxed because a very rich friend of his has promised to pay the entire fine on his behalf. He knows that when a sentence is declared, well, the penalty is already dealt with for him. The other man, he's relaxed because he doesn't understand the seriousness of his guilt. He believes he'll probably be found innocent. He probably won't have to pay the fine. Both of them look relaxed. Neither of them, as it were, have fear of the judgment. But one of them, the second man, should be very, very concerned. A day of judgment lies ahead. A day of accounting and reckoning. And yet many folk seem relaxed about it. They live their lives with little thought of that day. They're not atheists. They believe that there is something up there, something out there, but they believe it'll be okay. Whatever divine accounting they're going to face, it won't be too extreme. Some St. Peter figure standing by pearly gates who wraps the knuckles but then lets them in, that they'll be able to say, well, yes, I've not been perfect, but Look at the good things I've done. They'll outweigh the bad things. They are relaxed when they should be terrified. They have offended the God of holiness and purity. They stand condemned before him. They stand in danger of an ongoing and everlasting damnation in hell. The Christian is different. The peace of the Christian is not one of indifference or indolence. The Christian knows they have failed. They know that left in themselves, they stand guilty. They know that to repay that debt to God, well, it would take them an eternity in hell. But they also know that debt is dealt with. Fear has torment, but there is no torment for the Christian, but rather a holy boldness. The Christian can say, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We did not love God, but he loved us. We did nothing to please God, but God did something to open up the gates of his favour toward us. We never asked for a rescue, but God sent a saviour. He sent his son The eternal son of God, the one who was uh, in the most intimate relation of the father, who was in within his very bosom, as it were, who was daily his delight. He was sent. He chose to come. He came into this world on a rescue mission. The father sent the son not as a prophet or a moral teacher or a good example, but as a propitiation for our sins. Christ came with the specific purpose of being the propitiation, the one who turns aside the righteous wrath of God by taking it to himself, by suffering in the place of his people, by bearing all of the guilt of all of his people in all of the world, by drinking down the great draft of hell deserved by them and by declaring in agony and victory, it is finished. 
So the Christian looks ahead to the day of judgment. And they don't think, well, I hope I'm good enough. How can I make myself better? Can I do this little thing without incurring too much guilt? Rather, the Christian knows their guilt. They know the hell they deserve, but they know their saviour has dealt with the entire amount, freeing them from a fear of hellfire and damnation, giving them a status that is beyond description. As Luther wrote, when the devil throws our sins up to us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean that I shall be sentenced to eternal damnation? By no means. For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction in my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Where he is, there I shall be also. So the day of judgment... It's a day of seriousness, but it's not a day to fear for the true Christian. It is a day that has been dealt with once and for all for the Christian at the cross of Calvary. Do you fear God or do you love God? How should you view that day of judgment? And the final question, well then, what should I be doing to put away fear? There are many things ahead of us in this coming year that we may be tempted to fear <clears throat> and the answer is not to try not to be afraid when franklin roosevelt spoke about the only thing to fear is fear itself what was his answer well his answer was to point people to himself to seek to work together to improve the situation in 1932 usa after the great depression but the Christian need not seek to eliminate fear from their lives. Our verse doesn't say the faithful Christian casts out fear, but rather perfect love casts out fear. A right fear of God, well, it is a wise attitude to have. It is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. And often the lack of God fearing in our land even in our lives and our churches. It doesn't come from a, a mature and perfected love, but it comes rather from a poor view of God and his holiness. As you meditate on the nature of God, on his power and his perfection and his perfect justice, you may find a growing fear of God, and that is not unhelpful. If it drives you to your knees, if it drives you to be closer to him, that's a good thing. But to see fear ultimately cast out, to be so full of love that there is no room for fear, you must grow in love for God, an increasing longing for him, a greater joy in him, a stronger desire to see him glorified in your life and in your habits, in your family, in your workplace, in your community. So mature in him. Grow in knowledge about him and of him. The God who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. He's not now going to neglect or reject his people. He who saw hell and has closed the gates of hell for you is not going to uh, stop caring for you with anything smaller than hell itself. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is not going to try and punish you for wrongdoing when Christ has paid your debt in full. True, at times, God may chastise you. He may bring you under discipline because he loves you, because he wants to purge out indwelling sin. He wants to make you more like the Lord Jesus. But that's an act of love, not an act of wrath. You need not fear his harshest work because it comes from an overflowing heart of love for you, Christian. You need have no fear regarding national or political events because the God who loves you is the God who orders all things. The rulers rise and fall according to his plans. Nations do nothing that he does not permit. Not an atom moves apart from his permitting it. Your soul stands eternally safe 
in Christ. Your body is destined for a final renewing into one fit for a new heavens and a new earth. Your property is going to be consumed in the final conflagration that is going to bring an end to this old heaven and earth. So your great need is not to try and minimise fear and be less afraid, but to maximise love. A love for God. An increasing knowledge of and experience of his love for you. A growing love for his people and a delight in speaking of the lover of your soul to all you meet. As you grow in love, well, quite naturally, fear will ebb being cast out by a maturing and complete love. In fact, the only thing really for you to fear is that which takes you from this love. That indolent laziness that quietens your ardour for God, that steals your time for prayer and Bible reading, that distracts you from meditating upon him. False teachers, erroneous doctrines, they will do far more to damage your love for God if you let them than any physical persecution this world may throw at you. So cling to him, his word, his ways. Seek in all things to do his will from a heart filled with love and where There is still a mixture of a fear of God and a love for God. Don't beat yourself up about it. It is right and good to fear God. But aim to love him more and more to grow in your knowledge of him. Do you love him? If you have no love for him, this God, if he seems at the the moment to you to be distant, well, that is because you have never Come to know him for yourself. But this God who is the God of justice and might and majesty, who is to be feared by anyone sensible who is not filled with a perfect love for him, he's the God who sent his son to die for sinners like you. The judge of all the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one who, when he walked on earth, was called the friend of sinners. The one who spent time with those who were seen as the worst of society, who accepted them, who, who, who spoke to those laden with sin and called to them and said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the God the Bible holds out to us, the true God. And so if you have never loved him before, well, there is a saviour for you tonight, a saviour who accepts those who before now have never bowed their knees to him, but to those who cry out to him for rescue, who say, I see nothing but my sin and my guilt. I see nothing but my condemnation. There is a saviour for men and women like that who will not crush the bruised reed, who will not extinguish the smoking flax, but rather calls you to come tonight for forgiveness a new life, a new eternity, a new love in Christ.